dear friends uh, welcome to the 20th session of uh, uh, legal empowerment through interaction lecture series we had splendid lectures earlier interaction also and still continuing by way of messages etc today we have an entirely different subject which uh, which we are not dealt with till date that is regarding labor legislation especially a new enactment which has come into force i mean uh, has just been enacted that is the code of wages 2019 its um, impact and implications we have dr anuja dealing with that i take this opportunity to welcome all of you especially uh, justice ram kumar justice jayashankar nambiar and all others who have come today mm -hmm. to be part of this uh, interactive session of exchange of ideas and of course legal learning over to you anuja ji <coughs> Thank you so much, Advocate Shampadman. Uh, a warm greetings to one and all. Uh, I'm new to this lecture series. I'm the happiest. I feel privileged to be a part of this wonderful lecture series uh, under this particular platform. Uh, to all my seniors out there within the legal fraternity, uh, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity. Uh, to the judges over there, to the senior advocates over there, to whom I have been hearing throughout for the week. Uh, thank you so much, and I feel I'm much more privileged when I have my students on the other end, uh, like my friends, my colleagues, and my students from Tamil Nadu National Law University at the other end. Thank you so much for all of you to, to be there, and I beg uh, pardon. Probably I'll be having the overtones of an academician, and I beg pardon really with regard to this. So let me start this discussion with a particular understanding of my knowledge. That is. Labor laws are always uh, known for all the wrong reasons. Why? Because there have been too much of controversies coming out from the trade unions, from the laborers, from the employers, from the government side. And throughout all these perspectives, we are likely to have a colored version that you're trying to uh, be uh, informed with. And that's why I thought I should start with a foundational premise uh, with regard to whatever I'm talking for the day. Uh, so let me get into a small introductory kind of understanding uh, as to how I have framed my convictions with regard to what I'm trying to discuss over for the day on the topic. The topic is specifically on Code on Wages 2019, the impact and implications. Uh, I wanted to make it the concept impact and implications because impact always refers to the sudden changes that may happen and implication always refers to the, uh, the long-term strategy, the long-term concerns. It's an audio problem. Yeah, that is somebody has to be unmuted. Uh, okay, okay, I've done that. Sorry, sorry for the disturbance. Please continue. So when I'm just outlining my foundational premise, let me tell you that we had a wonderful colonial legacy with regard to whatever we had been talking about, discussing about. Today, throughout the newspapers, you can see about something or the other about the labor reforms happening, like Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh and many other states like Gujarat going for relaxation of labor laws to see on one side, the interstate migrant workmen, workmen running over to their native place. And they do a whole, find a whole lot of complexities, uncertainties in this world of depression as of now. So I'll try to make this presentation as soft and as smooth as possible. But let me take out some time to bring before you the context. Always the law is to be studied in the text, from the context and also by action. Text is always the black letter word, of course. So trying to outline the context, uh, India had been the founder member in 1990 in the ILO. And so always there had been the vociferous uh, participation shown by India with regard to ratifying its convention since ILO stands for the International Labor Trend Sector concept. And around 47 con conventions India had ratified and we have always been into uh, the frontline fighter with regard to ratifying the eight core fundamental human rights conventions out of which two are pending as of now and the six already we have ratified. So that is all from the international situation. There was once upon a time when ILO was talking about labor is not a commodity to be considered as such or commodity to be purchased or sold. And that's where the symbiotic relationship of the labor and capital comes in. And that's how I would like to start with. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights talks about all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Then why not the labor or the workforce? And that's my question that comes to my mind as of now. So when we talk about the situation of uh, the concept of labor is not a commodity to be purchased or sold, over a period of time, too much of water has flown and we had the wonderful laws coming up specifically without uh, ignoring the, bo the borrowings we had from the colonial legacy, we did add many piecemeal labor legislations coming over a time period 
uh, and that too on different situations on the, addressing different vulnerabilities maybe in the case of interstate migrant workmen maybe in the case of contract laborers maybe in the context of bonded labor maybe in the context of equal remuneration or what the, or what not that's how it can be put it so when labor is not a commodity to, to be purchased uh, at a later point of time ilo tried to change its understanding and to transform itself fully knowing that the benefits of globalization has not been dispersed effectively within the developing economies so with this they slightly changed their agenda of this from the labor is not a commodity to be purchased or sold to the concept of decent work agenda and india had been taking up this cause from 2013 to 2017 the decent work agenda program was happening within the india specifically concentrating on interstate migrant workmen feminization of labor issues the informalization of the casual labor issues the more vulnerable vulnerabilities with regard to contract labor etc so that's how on one side we can see how the ilo had been uh, vociferously been through us and india had been a part of that all those kind of uh, ventures that the ilo had been into so from there if we move on to the constitution of india a wonderfully drafted dream of the india which talks about article 43 and article 39 specifically in the context of directive principles of state policy the living wages and also the right to livelihood of the work so that's what where we think about the understandings of justice social economic and political so it all talks about the concept of laborers or the working force that we are talking about and then if we move on to the judicial interpretations we have awesome a team number of judicial that had come up from the supreme court which talks about the proactive understanding that should go behind the rights and vulnerabilities attached to the labor force it's interesting at this point i would like to share with you the statement from professor ubendra bakshi he says uh, the supreme court got krishnayarized krishnayarized i would again like to repeat it to make the supreme court uh, to make it a supreme court for the indians that is really interesting with professor professor ubendra bakshi to talk so that means uh, or it talks at length a whole lot of judicial decisions that had come up specifically like umi choi versus union of state of kerala we have the bijoy cotton mills the edward mills case and what not so many cases that had been there proactively upholding the rights of workers so we cannot uh, remove all these kinds of discussions like the 90 year old academic debate that has been going on the kind of trade unionization the trade union movements that they had come up the role played by bp vadia and nm joshi the philanthropist and the social reformers all had played its own role with regard to the kind of labor legislation that we see as of now then what's the problem with the existing labor laws that's one of the points we need to ponder about i already told you that we have so many piecemeal fragmented labor legislations of which many of them are protective in nature regulatory in nature many of them are uh, of welfare in the welfare context and so many kind of uh, rights are being guaranteed to the workmen and we do have different definitions of workers workmen employees and what not and that's how the complex complexities has come but i feel with the advent of the liberalization and the globalization issues there had been a small trend even within the judiciary also that we see when we talk about the sale case specifically when it says that there cannot be an automatic absorption of the contract laborers by the principal employers when the contract labor system ceases to exist and so we do have such kind of kind of cases also so we can call it as a mixed bag of successes and failures so let me take you to the context of specifically uh how can we understand the code of wages 2019 in this situation so basically it has got a far reaching implication that will be building upon the employers uh and it is in the air as of now it has been passed by both the houses the presidential assent is also received by august 8 2019 and as of now it is in the air meeting three days will be in one second there is some disturbance let me is there any problem some audio problem one second one second okay go ahead please sorry thank you uh, sorry i am unaware about what's happening over the other end <laughs> so uh, when we talk about the today's discussion the code on wages 2019 what are the far reaching implications that the employer should be keeping in mind that's one issue that we need to do 
And whenever we talk about the trilogy, that is the motto of the ILO, the trilogy between the symbiotic relationship between the employers, the employees, and the government. The government has its own version naturally. They talk about the ease of doing business. Interestingly, the, the Business Report 2020, published by the World Bank, talks about India ranks 63rd rank with it out of 190 countries, 190. And from 2018, around 14 leaps or 14 jumps has been made by India. And India comes within the top 20, sorry, top 10 countries with best performance indicator. But something that's ridiculous when we talk about ease of doing business report 2020 is it's based upon the case study or whatever is understood from the Indian context. It's only about the standardized business units, one or two, taken from the metro cities of Bombay and Delhi. So the trillion dollar question is, can these kind of standards be representing the whole kind of unorganized workforce and organized workforce situations within the Indian scenario? So that is one question we need to look into as and when we go through all these kind of labor reforms. Correspondingly, many other reforms are happening. The labor reforms, the financial reforms, the one, one second, one second. There is some disturbance. Uh, can all others mute? If there is anybody who is not muted, please. So that the uh, audio disturbance can be awarded to the... Okay. Can I continue? Yeah, one, one, just give us a second so that uh, Murali Bargain, please. Yeah, that's done. Yeah, please. Thank you. On one side, the government talks about ease of doing business. The employers talk about the concept of that we do have difficulty with procedural compliances. Too many laws are there and too many proceduralities are prescribed for and which creates difficulty with regard to the maintenance of the records. We do want to simplify the laws plus and we do find difficulties, specifically the of the industrial disputes act, where firing becomes difficult when it consists of more than 100 number of workmen. So that is the state of the employers. When it comes to the workers of the employers, they have their own vulnerabilities attached with regard to they are not being paid the minimum wages. The minimum wages is already, the right to minimum wages is already considered to be a part of right to life under Article 21 of the Constitution of India. Right to life definitely envisages right to decent life and decent livelihood and decent work. And that's how the concept or the clamoring of uh, the claims that are coming from the trade unions or the employees exist. So each and every actors within the labor scenario, whether it be the government, whether it be the employees, whether it be the employees, they have their own view, their own perspectives. And very often there is a question, why is it that the labor laws are so lagging behind? It's very clear and obvious that to bring in a, a adjustment or an agreement within these parties had been a Herculean task. Since 1947, the talk about, think about the kind of deliberations that I have attended as a person representing the academia, specifically whenever the deliberations on labor laws had been happening within the field. So it, it takes a whole lot for us to understand as to it's not that easy, it cannot be, uh, the, all the labor reforms cannot be done one fine morning and everything can be made so easy. Why? Because we are talking about human beings. Human beings, the rights, the concerns, the human rights, and that's where we cannot find out a compromise with regard to, yes, A can be compromised for B. So there cannot be compromise that can be happening. With this foundational premise, let me take you to the, the worldwide understanding or the international understanding of sustainable development goals. 2030, we are waiting, awaiting the understandings coming up, which talks about migrant workers, which talks about gender equality and whatnot. And they have an interesting motto, which I would like to talk to you about. No one shall be left behind. So again, from my personal perspective, I would like to take this also forward, carry forward, wherein I keep or I bring in my statements uh, so that I can justify the convictions that I'm talking about. So when we talk about wages for 2019, uh, Advocate Sean, can we just go to the second slide with the picture? Can you hear me? Second slide with the picture. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is just a beginning of the understanding of what I was talking to you all about. 
there's a whole lot of issues that comes up over here when we talk about the organized and the unorganized workforce. Just let me share one of my experiences with me when I was giving a lecture in Germany uh, in the context of International Teaching Week. So one of the students asked me, one of the German students asked me, uh, what is it so important about the unorganized workforce? We have not heard about it. Then uh, I had to tell them about what, what exactly is the difference between the organized and the unorganized workforce, how it uh, plays within the labor market regime within the developing economies like Bangladesh, India, and many other Asian countries. So that is one of the difficulties that I was, I was facing because the, the concept that we have with regard to the pace of labor legislation, the labor movements, the labor legislations that the West has doesn't fit into the tailor-made approach that we have within India. So when we talk about the 93% of the unorganized workforce and the 7% of the organized workforce, so this is for a statistical understanding uh, emanating from uh, Arjun Sen Gupta's uh, report, so which I wanted to bring before you, that when we talk about labor laws, have we brought in all these 93% in uh, informal workers within is one question to be looked into. So it is with this angle or perspective that I would like to move about. Just, uh, can we move on to the second slide? Uh, sorry, third slide, Advocate Shyam. Third slide. The moorings, thank you, thank you. The moorings, uh, what I meant by this slide is with regard to what had gone behind the understandings of, uh, uh, to find out the understandings behind the Code of Wages 2019. So first I have written the NCL 2 2002 before. So there had been many discussions going on with regard to it, with regard to consolidation, rationalization, and simplification of labor laws. And that's how uh, this particular kind of single umbrella system has come up from the NCL2 uh, report, which talks about there should be the amalgamation of labor laws happening under four heads. And one is with regard to industrial relations, one is with regard to wages, one is with regard to social security, and one is with regard to the uh, occupational safety, health, working and welfare conditions with regard to workers. So based upon which uh, these kind of discussions went on with the Budalingam report and specifically the National Commission on Rural Development led by Ila Arun, the Metsese Award winner and many other committees which talked about the feasibility of the amalgamation of labor laws. So now the present situation is both the houses have approved this and the president has given the note with regard to this and the wage of code is 2019 is the first to come out and the others are in the pipeline, which that have been described by the NCL2 2002 report. Coming to the second situation that I have uh, displayed in the slide, complexities of labor compliance is felt by the employers and the unions on the other side. So I told you about what, could, what all could be gone behind as to the employees' concerns and the employers' concerns, as I, I have already talked about it. Then there was a need for standardization of definition. There had been an umpteen number of definitions on the same terminology spread across the legislations. Interestingly, you have 45 central labor legislations and 200 and more state legislations that we are talking about. So think about the situation when these legislations talk with different ambit and perspectives about the same terminology. Interestingly, we used to advocate and justify when I'm invoking Industrial Disputes Act, I'm using the definitions prescribed under Industrial Disputes Act, which has got a specific objective to be used. And interestingly, all these labor legislations, whether it be protective, whether it be welfare, whether it be regulatory, it has its own objective to be attained. Say, for example, Minimum Wages Act. It talks about that there should be the minimum wages guaranteed to, which is in consonance with the minimal livelihood of the workers which enables them to provide for the sustenance of himself and also his family members, which we have added on. The interpretations get added to the issue interpretations. Coming to payment of wages, act, it has its agenda to provide for or to ensure timely payment of wages. And we talk about payment of bonus act. Definitely the laborers should have a share with regard to profit streets by the employer. So the effective payment of bonus and whatever be the terms. Then when we talk about equal remuneration act, the kind of gender disparity, the gender pay gap that exists to eliminate such kind of situations and that too, talking about the concept of Article 39B, equal pay for equal work. All these are the different ideologies that gets reflected through different piecemeal fragmented labor legislations. So there was a need to standardize these definitions and that was the long standing, uh, the clamor that was being made by the employers. 
coming to the existence of piecemeal laws, I told you we have so many, 45 central laws and 200 state legislations. So nothing more to explain on that. Coming to the protracted legislations, maybe at the quasi judicial authority level, at the first level, or maybe it could be at the uh, for, uh, the kind of uh, the court structure, the court of law also that has added on to it. Here, let me bring before you one of my experiences. When we interact with the labor commissioners, specifically when I was interacting in one of the contexts, there was a conference happening with regard to uh, the chambers of commerce at Bangalore. So one of the uh, Pertinent points raised by a labor commission. I understand when I use the terminology labor commissioner, I mean the regulatory mechanism. We always blame the regulatory mechanisms that they are falling short with regard to attaining the objectives. But he said, we have maximum litigation in Karnataka on minimum wages. Simply to justify that, the HR personnel were the audience. They said that we find it so difficult to the employers to convince them that the minimum wages is not is to be paid is to be the, uh, mandatorily to be paid and they asked me a question how can we ensure how can we convince the employer that minimum wages should be given so think about the situation when the stakeholders whether it be the labor commissioner whether it be the hr personnel the different versatile stakeholders the kind of concerns they are having we do have on one side the judicial interpretations coming up you should not be giving nothing less than the minimum wages if you make a person do the work without giving the wages or without uh, giving less than the minimum wages fixed, it will be a case of forced labor or beggar. PUDR versus Union of India, Sanjit Roy versus State of Rajasthan. And we have a whole lot of judicial interpretations coming up to that particular context. Still, we do find refractive legislation. Interestingly, I was going through an economic survey report recently. It says 40, 63% subject to correction, 63% of the workers are entitled to minimum wages and 33% are awaiting uh, at the doors of the court with regard to getting their verdict with regard to the entitlement to minimum wages. So that is how the existing system works. But I'm not to blame anyone because I have seen from all the angles and perspectives. Then we have another problem of Inspector Raj controversy. So Inspector is always uh, accused of being uh, instrument of connivance with the employers or collusion with the employers. And very, very less we hear about situations wherein the employer gets convicted for any of the contraventions or offenses that are being prescribed or in research under a legislative framework. So too much of leeway is given to the inspector system and inspection system. There is, it's like, and what, what you say, unruly hopes. That's how you explain it. So that is yet another controversy coming up. There's another perspective and urge to overhaul the so-called outdated and highly redundant labor laws. So one claim is that the labor laws have become highly obsolete and redundant because we do have so many definitions coming up. We do have many procedural compliances. Why not? It can be cut short. It can be reduced to one or two, like we see in the situation of China. They have a wonderful voluminous labor law at their hand with more than six, uh, one to three sections or so subject to correction. Another clearing call from the government was with regard to obtaining three objectives, consolidation, the rationalization, and the simplification of labor laws. So that's how we need to look at why these kind of labor reforms are happening. And correspondingly, many other uh, parallel reforms like financial reforms, banking sector regulations, reforms, etc. are happening. And uh, the concept that they have in their mind with regard to ease of doing business, the 2020 report. And India is dreaming about the uh, the three trillion economy by 2024, subject to correction, the three trillion concept. So this is how uh, the whole lot of moorings has come up, whether it be from the National Commission, whether it be from the other committees that have come up, whether it be from the judicial interpretations, or whether it be from the employers, employees, and the government's perspective. Shall we move on to the next slide, Advocate Shah? Sure. This is what I told about the labor reforms in A. Because I cannot read or we should not be reading the Code on Wages 2019 as a single uh, platform or as a single book or single code which can enable you to understand the existing labor scenario. So I have brought before you the kind of uh, bifurcations that uh, it is in the air and which is in the pipeline. So understand Code on Wages 2019 uh, is awaiting at any point of time the notification that is to be enforced very soon and that is its present position. So when I mean foreign wages 2019, it includes Minimum Wages Act 1948, Payment of Wages Act 1936, Equal Remuneration Act 1976, and Payment of Bonus Act 1965. 
the four major wages legislations are getting amalgamated or getting subsumed into one single code. So we are trying to bring in all the uh, relatively prominent positions and provisions together so that it will get into the concept of a code kind of understanding. Alongside industrial relations code is also coming up. It is in the pipeline 2019, which will be amalgamating Industrial Disputes Act of 1947, Trade Unions Act of 1926, Industrial Employment Standing Orders Act of 1946. So amalgamating these three laws, you will have a separate individual code which is in the pipeline and we are awaiting its uh, ever arrival from the pipeline, unlike that of the wage code. The third one bifurcation will be the social security code and the social security code is very interesting. We have studied uh, or we have learned about or we have been practicing with regard to the major social security legislation, the ESI Act, the EPF Act, the Payment of Gratuity Act, the Maternity Benefit Act and uh, you have the concept of uh, one thing I have missed out. Employees Compensation Act of 1923. These are the five major social security legislations. Alongside, we are bringing in, building another Construction Workers Act and two other legislations. Amalgamating all these legislations, there is in the pipeline, the Social Security Code 2019. The fourth and the last one will be the Occupational Health and Working Safety, Health and Working Conditions Code which will be amalgamating around 13 legislations, including Interstate Migrant Workmen, Contract Labor Act, and many Factories Act, and many other uh, vulnerable situations. Like say, for example, the BD Workers Act, you have the Cinema Workers Act, you have Journalist Act, etc. So all these will be amalgamated within the concept of OSH code. So we have four major codes, out of which the wage code is considered to be the progressive one, and that is awaiting its notification and in the sense enforcement date. Moving on to the next slide. And thank you. I just want to bring before you what had been the situation earlier and what is happening with the wage code 2019. So for this purpose, I have jotted down some points. I'm not that a tech savvy, so I have jotted down some points wherein at times I will have to read out certain definitions to, to make the things very clear to you. So when we talk about the first point in the scene, uh, this is only just bird's eye view. Why a bird's eye view? Because uh, the whole code consists of 69 sections and eight chapters, sorry, nine chapters, which talks at uh, which talks from different perspectives. So I have picked and chosen certain kind of provisions which are very much necessary to be looked into so that a peripheral understanding of what all are the new changes that are likely to come up very soon, what all we will have to catch up with. That's what I was trying to look into. So the first major knockdown impact will be inclusiveness of the unorganized and organized sector workers. I told you in India, we have the bifurcation of unorganized sector and the organized sector. Organized sector means everything is fine over there. You have a whole lot of regulations over there. Everything, the, you will get timely wages. The working conditions are fixed. The hours are fixed. The working hours are fixed. The payment is fixed. The timely payment happens. Everything is fine. But when we talk about the unorganized workforce, it's all about uh, there is a whole lot of uncertainty. You may not be having uh, a, even a written contract with your employer. You may not be in a situation to find out who is your employer. You might be an interstate migrant workman. After having left the home state, you are in the host state with no idea, with no identity, with no kind of uh, the support structure or the support system. So it's just an example that I've picked up. It could be the self-employed workers, the domestic workers, the contract laborers. And that's why the concept of informalization of the formal economy has come. So feminization of the economy, is, uh, the workforce is yet another situation coming up in this situation. Uh, it was interesting to read recently one of the articles from EPW, Economic, Political and Weekly, which talks about the labor laws in India are highly classist, uh, casteist and gender which I approve definitely when we look into certain kind of provisions, the way it gets implemented, the kind of manipulations that happen. So, so when we look into the first point for our purpose, for our discussion, inclusiveness. How has this wage code brought in inclusiveness of all the employments, all the employees and all the workers? So let me tell you, we have the Payment of Wages Act. So what was the problem with the existing legislations was that we had the concept of scheduled employments, we had the concept of number clause, we had the concept of size of the establishments and many other parameters. 
and some of the legislations even talked about threshold salary limit. That means eligibility depends upon the threshold salary limit that is fixed by under that particular act. So very many constraints and criterias had been brought in to the existing legislations. I meant Minimum Wages Act, Payment of Wages Act, Equal Remuneration Act, and the Payment of Wages Act. So Payment of Wages Act, if you take individually, it was applicable to some of the definite and the notified industries. Alongside state governments started adding many industries to the notified industries, and it became a big bunch, big list with regard to all those establishments wherein employers were obligated to go for the compliance with payment of wages. That means timely payment of wages and the proper amount should be given at the proper timing. That was the main agenda behind the payment of wages act. And based upon which there was a threshold salary limit brought in under payment of wages act. That is to be 24,000. Only those persons were employed under that particular establishment and drawing rupees 24,000 and that too within rupees 24,000 per month will be entitled to the benefits arising under the payment of wages. Payment of wages act basically talk about timely payment of wages, uh, the legalized deductions and the kind of overtime rates that could be provided there with regard to the, the work that you are into. Now what is happening with the code, uh, the wage code 2019? Payment of Wages Act is made applicable. The payment of wages should is entitled uh, in the sense that all the employees and all the workers are entitled to payment of wages and timely payment applicable to all industries irrespective of the size, the threshold limit, etc. The salary threshold limit of rupees 24,000 is completely removed. So that means it covers all types of establishment, private or public or the governmental sector. So that is the, the change happening. Moving on to Minimum Wages Act, it was basically running with the help of the scheduled employment. The state governments, uh, taking the report from what is happening within their state domain, they will enter each and every occupation. That too, wherein semi-skilled and unskilled workers are involved, different processes and different occupations will be listed in a scheduled employment. And those who are involved or employed in such kind of processes or occupation, coming within the scheduled employments will be entitled to the benefits under Minimum Wages Act. So they are entitled to get the minimum wages. So that was understanding. Thankfully, no threshold limit was put uh, as per the minimum wages. Act. Coming to wage code, as usual, there is no uh, threshold, salary threshold that is being looked into here. And the concept of scheduled employments are done away with. Let me bring before you some of the students who are listening to this. When you talk about scheduled employments, it is the prerogative of the state government. Say, for example, Assam might have included the cement industry within the scheduled employment. Gujarat might have included the pre-stressed products of the cement industry or occupations to be a part of the notified or the scheduled employments. Gujarat might have done in a totally different manner. So it becomes difficult for the employers to find out whether my establishment comes in within that particular notified employment so that I will have been in compliance with the Minimum Wages Act. So that complexity is removed as of now with this change in the wage code. Coming to payment, sorry, coming to equal remuneration act. Thankfully, no change has happened over there. There was no applic uh, limitation applicability, no threshold limit was there, no number was there provided on the equal remuneration act. It was applicable to every employer. The same situation exists now. Also. A change has been brought in with regard to payment of bonus act, with regard to computation of bonus. When we talk about the Payment of Bonus Act 1965, the earlier legislation, sorry to call it as the earlier legislation, is just to bifurcate the earlier and the new code, that's all. But understand still it is in existence unless the new wage code is, uh, the wage code is um, enforced. Coming to Payment of Bonus Act, it was applicable to all industries and types of establishments. It had a number clause, having 20 or more it's interesting to note many of the labor legislations have this kind of number clause. When you look into interstate migrant workmen, it talks about five number clause. When you look into contract labor, it talks about ten number clause. Many others, for example, factory, many other labor legislations, they talk about twenty number clause. The number clause has created a whole lot of confusion. So only if you end up with such kind of criteria, satisfying such kind of criteria, you will be entitled to such kind of benefit. So threshold salary limit was also fixed under payment of bonus act that is to be 21,000. So now let's see what is happening with the wage code once it is notified, how it looks like. Interestingly, the number clause remains unchanged. That means the 20 or more persons in an establishment that is there. 
and then the salary threshold is removed. That means rupees twenty one thousand salary threshold is totally removed now. And in that place, there comes up the salary threshold level that will be fixed by the central government or the state government. Or the bonus will be computed on the higher minimum wages that will be made at the kibbutz. So that is how it is understood. So interestingly, there is an option given the state governments to come up with different threshold salary limits. So assuming the scenario, see, I understand payment of bonus at this step is a central legislation. It was guided by central rules. There was a threshold limit of rupees twenty-one thousand. So there was no confusion with regard to how to go about with the computation of bonus. But now two new scenarios set. One is, what if the minimum wages fixed is less than the threshold limit uh, that has been prescribed by the central government or the state government? So if that is the case, definitely it affects the computation of the bonus. The other scenario will be, what if the threshold Uh, salary limits are differently set by different state governments. So again, computation of bonus will be ending up with complexities with regard to in terms of which is to be fought. Either the salary threshold level, wherein the state governments as an option to come up with a uh, uh, the threshold level, or if in case the minimum wage is higher, say for example, the minimum wage fixed by a particular state is rupees twenty five thousand, and the threshold limit is rupees twenty one thousand. So naturally. The computation of bonus happens in terms of rupees twenty five thousand because that is the minimum wages, the higher amount which is applicable in that particular context. So this is how, uh, interestingly, we say universalization of benefit to all the workers. One good thing that has happened is, irrespective of the size of the establishment, irrespective of the number of hours, irrespective of the employment that you are into, irrespective of the arduousness of the work that you are doing. All kinds of employees and workers are brought within the concept of uh, the wage code, and specifically, you have brought in the provisions with regard to payment of minimum wages, timely payment of wages, payment of bonus, and equal remuneration without any gender discrimination. So, this is what I would like to talk to you on the first point. The second point is with regard to bringing in uniformity with regard to definitions, which was the long-standing difficulty that was there. Specifically in the context, uh, the piecemeal legislations. So what is happening here is, let me bring before you the understandings of first the establishment. The establishment was decide, uh, defined by Payment of Wages Act and Payment of Bonus Act. So now it says it means any place wherein any industry, trade, business, manufacture, or occupation is carried out and includes government establishment. So it covers all kinds of businesses, industries, trade, etc. Coming to the concept of uh, the employer, employer was already defined under Payment of Wages Act, Payment of Bonus Act, then the Equal Remuneration Act, and the payment, the Minimum Wages Act. So one clarity that is brought in with the concept of employer is for factories. When you understand the, how the Factories Act works, coming to the factories, the occupier or the manager is considered to be the employer. So and that is how it brings in much more clarity because we had many judicial decisions coming up and very many situations wherein when a when a factory site was given for lease when it was leased out to some other persons upon whom the liability falls in. So here there is a clarity brought in with regard to the occupier or the manager whom so ever is named as per the application section seven factory site will be the uh, the a person to take the take up the liability. And then we have the concept of uh, contractor and contract labourer defined under this particular act. Interestingly, interstate migrant worker is included under contract labourer under this particular act. Nowhere we find the uh, any mentioning of contract labourers throughout the act. But understand, OSH part is in the pipeline, and you do get to know about their benefits and right entitlements under the uh, OSH part, occupational safety and so forth. Coming to the other important definition now, which is standardized as of now through the wage code, the employee. It was first defined by Minimum Wages Act, Payment of Wages Act, and Payment of Bonus Act. So now, employee means any person other than apprentice under the Apprentice Act of 1961, employed on wages, and it includes skilled, semi-skilled, unskilled, manual, operational, supervisory, with no salary threshold. Managerial, administrative, technical, or clerical work. Almost every kind of establish, every nature of work is brought in under the concept of employees, making it a broad-based kind of definition that we have brought in here. 
and it does not an employee does not include any member of the armed forces because they're guided by their own legal regime so that is what is happening in the standardized definition of employee coming to another interesting definition that we have under the wage code is worker the worker was earlier defined under the equal remuneration act and the equal remuneration act talks about there should not be discrimination between man worker and woman worker so basically man versus woman kind of uh, the gender pay gap disparity that was coming up so now we have an interesting uh, subsection of the employee definition as worker which says it includes any person except an apprentice under the section 2 apprentice this act and it includes any manual unskilled skilled technical operational clerical or supervisory work so to, we have excluded managerial capacity personnel the, the personnel working in the administrative capacity and also the court excludes those supervisor the, those personnel in supervisory posts drawing more than rupees 15000 it's very interesting when you go back to the industrial disputes act it talks about personnel involved in supervisory work drawing more than 10000 as per the 2010 amendment act here is a change which talks about the threshold limit of rupees 15000 it excludes armed forces the navy police personnel it excludes the police the uh, the personnel involved in the police service and also the prison uh, institutions so this is how the worker is also brought in interestingly it excludes working journalists and also so it includes working journalists and sales promotion employees very interestingly the last part of the definition of the workman under industrial disputes act is imported into wage code it says a, a, a small paragraph a small inclusive portion from the earlier industrial disputes act 1947 is imported into as being a part of the worker under the wage code so that is with regard to establishment employee worker and now let me take you to the most important uh, the controversial definition that we have or the controversy that we have with regard to the definition of wages let me take you to the earlier legislations first how it looks like sorry i was not possible it wasn't possible from my end to give you so much of wider clarity for the ppt slides but still i have my notes with me so coming to the existing definitions of wages across 11 labor legislations you find the definition of wages with different inclusions with different exclusions with no clarity with so much of complexity if you move on to the minimum wages act it says all remuneration it says it includes hra and it excludes many 1 2 3 for h house accommodation any amenity given by the employer contribution made by the employer to pay for the pension traveling allowance special allowances gratuity all these are excluded when you talk about payment of wages act it includes any award settlement overtime leave and cashment any amount paid on termination any sum payable to uh, the so as to uh, specifically as per the law prescribed all those are included excludes bonus not forming part as per the terms of the employment bonus was excluded coming to payment of bonus act the wages included da and excluded all the other components traveling concession bonus gratuity retrenchment compensation commission any other relevant coming to equal remuneration as it never defines wages thankfully and now with all these existing kind of legislations having different understandings of wages now what is happening is we are getting a definition a standardized definition for wages under the wage code 2019 it's very interesting it talks about the meaning of the wages then it says this is how the wages should be the basic Uh, pay plus the DMS elements plus the retaining elements. It moves on to talk about the exclusions. Around nine items are included in the exclusions. Many of the inclusions that were there in the earlier legislations are brought in under the exclusion under this wage code. No particular reason has been assigned with regard to why it has been excluded. So A to I clauses are there, which talks about the nine exclusions, like I have already read out. Any contribution made by the employer, any convenience elements, HRA. Remuneration payable under award or settlement, any overtime elements, gratuity payable, retrenchment compensation—all are excluded. Nine items are excluded. With a wonderful proviso: if any of the aggregate of any of these excluded items exceeds 50 percent of the total remuneration a particular person is getting, that excess should be considered as or deemed as a part of the wages. So there is a conditional limit that has been brought in with regard to the exclusions. 
And one more interesting proviso that you see under the wage code 2019 is with regard to equal remuneration. So I told you we have nine exclusions. Out of this nine exclusions, to find out uh, or to make sure that there is equal remuneration that is being made payable to the gender equally, whether it be man or woman or transgender, whatever it is, based on the same work, same responsibility principle, certain allowances are included within the concept of wages. So let me bring before you the four important areas. Uh, the exclusions under the basic definitions are included for the equal remuneration purposes. To understand equal remuneration talks about a totally different kind of object. So any conveyance elements payable, any value of any traveling elements, HRA, then remuneration payable under any award or settlement, or any overtime elements, four important items, which are excluded as a part of wages from the general definition of wages, is being made use of for the equal remuneration aspect provisions under the wage code. So one question comes up, are we, have we moved on to the uh, complexity levels or have we moved on to much more simplification levels? That is yet another question to be looked into. So that is how the standardization of definitions of these concepts has happened. Another important aspect of the concept that has come up is floor wage, national floor level minimum wage. When we talk about the Minimum Wages Act, we had the concept of minimum wages, how the state government will be fixing the minimum wages. Now a new concept comes in, central government will fix a national floor level wage. And none of the state governments could go less than that, in the sense could not fix minimum wages less than that. So understand, the minimum wages fixation happens at the level of the appropriate government, right? The floor level, national level, floor level minimum wage fixation happens at the domain of the central government. So say for example, the national floor level minimum wage is fixed as rupees 10,000. There cannot be a reduction that will be happening whenever the minimum wages fixation happens at the state of Tamil Nadu or state of Kerala. So say for example, they will have to increase the minimum wages from beyond 10,000 because there is a floor level wage that is already fixed, fixed and set by the central government. That's very interesting. But the problem is, earlier also we had this concept of floor level minimum wage fixed by the central government, but it was at a very minuscule level and which didn't have any understanding, which didn't have any statutory base. It is only through this wage code that this particular statutory or sanctity is being given with regard to the concept of floor level minimum wage. Interestingly, if any of the state governments has got a higher minimum wage fixed than the floor level minimum wage fixed by the central government, Definitely, the state government should not be reducing their minimum wage that has been fixed. They will have to retain it. And at no level, the minimum wage fixed by the state government can go behind or can go less than what is being guaranteed by the central government. So interesting to see that the law is trying to come up with a central level fixation, but there's no clarity as to how they will fix it. And it even says the central government, when it is fixing the floor level minimum wage, may vary from state to state depending upon the geographical locations, peculiarities, etc. So different national floor level minimum wage will be fixed by the central government at different state domains. And on the other side, or alongside state governments will fix the minimum wages also. But the basic principle is whatever is fixed by the central government should be the ultimate in case the minimum wages goes beyond. The minimum wage is fixed by the state government goes beyond. Above than that of the floor level minimum wage, nothing matters. There is nothing uh, happening with regard to it. No problem. You can go on with that. But still, central government is having a power with regard to come up with varying kinds of your floor level minimum wages. Coming to uh, the appropriate government, what, should, what all considerations should go behind with regard to fixation of minimum wage? Skill of the workers required for working under the categories of unskilled, semi-skilled, skilled, highly skilled, or geographical area, or both. So it, on one side, it depends upon the skill level. The second, it depends upon the geographical peculiarities. Either both or either any one of them. So state governments can fix the minimum wage either on geographical peculiarities also, or on both. So an option is given to the administrators to fix accordingly. In addition, Another important, another important prominence uh, is given to the concept of arduousness of the work involved. 
say for example the temperature the humidity uh, how it's norm how it's normally difficult for a normal person to go on with that the hazard of the occupations that they are into the processes the underground work or anything that may be prescribed from time to time by the government all these matters could be looked into the skill the arduousness of the work the geographical peculiarities and based upon which the state government will be fixing the minimum wages coming to the components of minimum wages under section 7 if there's no much change happening with regard to uh, the composition it can be of three formats like we have already looked into under the minimum wages act maybe basic plus allowances the second combination could be basic with or without allowances plus the concessional value the cash value of the concessional supplies or an all inclusive rate this has already been there within the earlier minimum wages act yet another important area is time line is fixed for the payment of wages which was not there in certain with the earlier existing legislations let me run through as to how it works so we we could have uh, been fixing say for example the limit on a daily rate weekly rate or monthly rate or the monthly rate if it's a daily wage period the, the timely payment should happen at the end of the shift if it's a weekly payment it should be happening the payment should go by the last working day of the week if it's fortnight fortnightly before the end of the second day after the fortnight if it's a monthly payment earlier there was a distinction wherein distinct uh, the distinction with regard to establishments having less than 1000 employees and more than 1000 employees now the uniform date is brought in the 7th day of the every month as different from that of the 10th day Do uh, I need to run through the, uh, Advocate Shyam Patman? Hello, I'll cut you. Anyway, the next yes, idea. Yes, you can. You can take your pace. No issues. Just go. Go ahead. <laughs> anyway, I'm having a faster pace. I know that. So, moving on to the next idea that we have uh, coming up from this particular uh, area of we just call equal remuneration policy of. non discrimination based on gender so here we have brought in under the wages code the concept of same work see equal remuneration act 1976 was basically a reflection of article 39b equal pay for equal work so in the initial stages we were looking into only the man worker and the woman worker specifically say for example here yeah, the construction work site or where in a huge gender disparity wage gap exists solely because of gender discrimination that was the main concern coming up so we went by man worker and the woman worker differentiation but now as and when we move on to the wage code it talks about there should not be any discrimination based on gender so man woman and also the transgender that is also taken into account it's interesting to note it was being passed at that uh, point of time when transgender bill was coming up now 2019 transgender act and the rules also had come up in the last week so that was also the concern coming up when transgender employees are being uh, brought in within the workforce there should not be any discrimination to that effect so what all could be looked into as same work so same work means the act says you should have the same skills same effort same responsibility and same experience same experience is a terminology which was not referred to in the earlier uh, in the equal remuneration act 1976 So it basically talks about the professional experience. So, say for example, a woman worker, if she goes in for the maternity leave, and she is uh, on par with a male worker with regard to getting her promotion or anything of that sort. So, in such situations, the professional experience also could be counted in favor of her. So that such situations will not be manipulated to see that the male worker uh, gets ahead of her. So that could be one scenario, hypothetical scenario that we can be talking about. coming to the concept of uh, the same experience another controversy that we need to look into is maybe we'll have to go by the circumstances the facts and circumstances basis but what i was trying to drive home the tension was that there is an express prohibition with regard to non discrimination on the basis of gender that's very important in the present days coming to another point that is there salient feature disqualification for entitlement to bond so earlier under payment of bonus act we had four areas wherein uh, the, even though you fit into the category of being entitled to the bonus payment if in case you end up with fraud violent behavior sabotage or misappropriation of the property to the employer definitely it was a case wherein you would have been uh, disentitled to get the bonus one more added or add on this qualification is brought in by the wage code that is 
conviction for sexual harassment. This is in tune with the Porsche Act 2013, the Prevention of Sexual Harassment Act 2013. So if in case an employer or a worker is into a situation that uh, a complaint is filed, and uh, may be dismissed and then the proceedings are going on and at last the conviction comes up with regard to that he had been the culprit behind and sexually uh, sexual harassment has taken place and it is proved and convicted in such situations he is disentitled to bonds but it will not be applicable in cases wherein he is um, an accusation comes in a complaint goes in and uh, he is admonished or uh, on the basis of warning he is only dismissed in such situations it will not be uh, uh, taken into consideration. We are looking into the concept of conviction for sexual harassment. So that is one new area that has been brought in through this particular wages code. Another area that is with regard to payment of overtime wages, anyone who does the overtime wage definitely should be receiving the double the overtime rate, the, uh, double the rate with regard to the you, uh, work for a normal uh, day and the wages, wage rate you get for that particular day. That's being ensured and assured through this wage code. Another area, as for the slide, is uh, the single register. That was yet another confusion that was persisting among the employers, which says that multiple registration and multiple registers, maintenance of multiple registers creates a whole lot of difficulty for the employees. So based upon that uh, controversy, now we, uh, the wage code moves on to the concept of single register. The single register for the employed people, the master rolls, the wages, the payment of wages, etc., so multiple registers were envisaged under Payment of Wages Act, Minimum Wages Act, and the Bonds Act. So uh, the understanding is it is the procedural compliance. Another major interesting aspect coming up is the role of the inspector. I talked to you about the inspector large controversy, the manipulation that could happen, the connivance that happens between the employers and the inspectors. Interestingly, wage court talks about dual role of the inspector. So the terminology totally gets changed. He is no more the inspector. The officer is no more the inspector. Inspector come facilitate. And his function increases in the sense he will be advising the employees. He will be advising the employers. An opportunity to cure can be given to both the sides rather than initiating prosecution in the first instance with regard to certain contravention that may happen. Interestingly, inspection scheme is to be jotted down, laid down by the profit government. It was not there in the earlier existing legislation. Interesting, inspection scheme, web-based inspection. And that is very, interest, very much interesting when you say web-based inspection. Earlier, the situation was inspector used to go to a particular establishment, uh, then sees, uh, the, uh, does the search and the seizure as per the criminal procedure code principles, and uh, the rules laid down over there, uh, take the testimony of uh, the statement of the uh, workers over there, and then initiate the prosecution. So now, interestingly, jurisdiction, free inspections can happen. That means web-based inspections can happen. Interestingly, self-declaration forms can be given by the employee saying that I'm purely fully complying with the labor compliance, the labor regulations that ought to be complied by me. So that is new, uh, interesting area coming up. The other important salient feature is settlement of claims under section 45, etc. There's an authority appointed by the appropriate government and the limitation period is fixed as three years. Earlier, from the existing legislations, we can understand there was a variation from, it can be from six months to two year term. Now there is a clarity and certainty with regard to the limitation period for filing the claim. So there's a burden, there's a um, responsibility on the employer to maintain and preserve the records for three years with regard to such kind of claims. So filing of claims by trade union is also allowed under this particular uh, interesting uh, situation. So much more longer opportunity can be availed. The three-year term can be availed by the applicant. Moving on to the next important uh, area, offenses, penalty, and compounding of offenses. Three important contraventions, are, uh, contraventions or breaches are envisaged under the code. One is the payment of an amount which is less than the amount due to the employee. In the sense, the uh, amount that should have gone to the employee is not proper, is not complete, is not sufficient. There is less payment that is made in the sense I would like to call as non-payment. Second one is non-maintenance of the proper maintenance record, the proper record, in the sense non-maintenance, non-preservation of the records. Third one is any other breach of any other provisions, any contravention that can happen throughout the legislative training. So three important contraventions, uh, when the amount paid is less, when uh, there is the, concept, the claim of non-maintenance of the records and any other situation. 
So the first one, when you talk about when the amount paid is less than what uh, is due to the employee, for the first contravention, there's a penalty of 50,000. And if convicted again within five years from the, first, from the date of the first conviction, it will go on up to imprisonment up to three months and up to one year final vote. Interestingly, for the non-maintenance of the proper records, the penalty is to be 10,000. And for any other, the third kind of contravention that may happen, for the first instance, you will have the rupees 20,000 penalty. For the conviction, again, the same offense within five years, imprisonment for one month or rupees 40,000 fine or with both. So there is, how this is how it is done. Interestingly, an opportunity to cure and heal is given in this particular chapter. It says that inspector come facilitator can advise the employer that this is not the way it is to be done. An opportunity to cure can be provided over there, based upon which no prosecution needs to be initiated at that point of time. But if in case it is a second situation that the contravention goes on within the five-year period or it goes on without uh, taking care of the advice given by the inspector or facilitator, it could be a case where prosecution can be outrightly started with. So understand this opportunity to cure is only available for the second and third categories, not for the first category. The first category is considered to be grave and much more uh, uh, serious. And that is why you don't have this opportunity to cure being made applicable to the first one. Payment of an amount which is not, um, which is less than or which is insufficient, uh, that is due to the employee. Compounding of offenses is also possible here at any time before or after the initiation of the prosecution. And offenses under the code can be compounded for a sum of 50% of the maximum fine prescribed for that particular offense. So once compounded, later on within a period of five years for the same offense, the compounding cannot be possible. So these are some of the important salient features uh, on a peripheral view, on a bird's eye view that I will be liking to, uh, I, will, I would like to bring before you. So this was a slide which I wanted to show when I was talking to you about the first point, universalization of uh, the benefits to the unorganized and organized sector. And so for the first part talks about the existing legislations, how they talk about it, the criteria and the limitations. The last part talks about the, how the wages code brings in, comes up with the changes. Let me tell you the impact with regard, the impact, the sudden impact with regard to all these kind of changes. The impact is very easily understandable, its applicability to all types of establishments. I told you how it becomes easily applicable irrespective of private, public, and government sector. The wage ceiling limit is totally cut off, other, otherwise than for the payment of bonus act, wherein a threshold limit will be decided by the central government or the state government. The number of clauses are done away with, except for the payment of bonus provisions. Scheduled employments are completely done away with. The impact is yes, we are trying to bring in almost all the unorganized workforces here. So that is one way of looking at it positively. Inclusion of around 50 crores of work. So when you go up with all these kinds of universalization issue, uh, the, uh, strategy, etc., you are bringing 50 crores of workers as benefit beneficiaries. Then uniform definition of wages, in a way, it's good. There's a standardized definition, but it adds on to the complexities. When we talk about that, there is a meaning given to wages, exclusion is given, and then it provides what it says that if in case Aggregated of, aggregate of the excluded provisions moves beyond, is beyond 50% of the remuneration that the employee is getting, it will be deemed as wages. So it adds on to the complexities too. So whether it is a standardized one, definition is a smoother one or a complex one, it will be true. Fixation of rate of uh, floor level minimum wages uh, it, it becomes very much decisive. So it all depends upon the, the political will of the central government, how far they would like to go for fixing the floor level minimum wage. So recently there was a trade union strike going on with regard to increasing the floor level minimum wage, equally applicable to the whole of India, the 21,000 rate. But it's all about the, uh, that there should not be an apathy from the part of the government while fixing this kind of floor wages. Then ex expedite settlement of claims process, good three years time is given and you have the Quasi judicial authorities appointed by the appropriate government and also the appellate authority with full powers of the civil court under uh, order five. So they can call for the documents and then get the statements, etc. Then eases the periodical labor compliance is good with regard to the single register. Other than the multiple register situation, you have the single register registers which can uh, do away with the procedural laxities. 
then universalization of minimum wage and timely payment of wages. See, whenever we talk about the wage code, it's about guaranteeing universalization of minimum wages to every employee. Earlier, the, um, the 2017 code that was their equivalence at that point of time was talking about only for workers. Now it includes all the employees to get the minimum wages and that to timely payment of wages, which has got positive um, understanding. Coming to the implications, I just wanted to put in many of them, many of these ideas in a negative uh, uh, connotation. And nothing to worry, this is the last slide, but I'm running through actually. So when we talk about the implications, it's all about the inclusion of unorganized workers. Let me take you to one interesting provision, uh, which talks about domestic purposes. Section 50, subsection 4, which talks about the domestic purposes. The employer is obliged to have to maintain the register, display of the notice, and issue of wage slips for the domestic workers, not for the domestic workers alone. So this, this says, section 50, subsection 4, provisions of subsection 1 to 3 shall not apply in respect of employer to the extent he employs not more than 5 persons for agriculture or domestic purposes. Explanation talks about the definition of domestic purpose. Domestic purpose is relating to home or family affairs of the employer and does not include any affair relating to an establishment, industry, trade, business, manufacture, or occupation. So I'll give a hypothetical situation. I'm the employer. I'm giving the house accommodation to one of the senior level employees. As he's residing over there. He maintains a driver, cook, gardener, and such kind of persons. If these number of persons exceed the file number limit, there's an obligation on the part of the employer, irrespective of the employer employee relationship. This is with regard to the domestic purposes, not with regard to professional purposes. The employer is obligated to maintain the register, the issue of the wage slips, and also the display of the notice with regard to such kind of services. So for the first time, the domestic worker is coming out to un under this particular provision with disability. Very often it is said that lesser the social economic status, lesser the visibility, more the social economic status, more the visibility. So this has been a good provision coming up for, with regard to the inclusiveness of the unorganized sector workers. But you don't find any definition for unorganized workers under the wages code 2019, interestingly. Moving on to the other point, removal of scheduled employment. From time to time, the state governments had been adding on to the scheduled employments. Uh, and one fine morning, you see that the scheduled employments are not there. So to what extent you bring in all kinds of workers? Still, the Economic Survey Report 2019 says that 33% of the workforce is out wage code 2019. So that's one implication coming up. Complexities in computation of wages. I told you about the complexity arising out of the standardized definition of wages. The exclusion part and the proviso. So this is added on to the complexities. And also read along with this the new PF ruling with regard to wages. Um, what was that? Vivekananda Vidya Mandir. West Bengal versus Vivekananda Vidya Mandir. Uh, that is the case name, uh, February 2019. So this is a case with regard to the inclusiveness of certain elements within basic wages and the reiteration of the bridge root principle, uh, the keys principle. So that has got its own understanding and connotations coming up. Then moving on to, there is no definition for minimum wage. It only says minimum wage means minimum wage fixed as per section so and so of, uh, if not wrong, section uh, 7 or 8 under the code. Then there is the controversy as between the floor level minimum wage which is for the central government and also by the state government. Then the computation of bonus, I told about the two scenarios when the minimum wage becomes higher and the threshold limits differs from state to state. Then we have the gender neutral approach. I say it will be an eye wash experience. Coming to Equal Remuneration Act, it talked about there should not be any discrimination neither in recruitment nor in promotion nor in training and all those. So coming to wages code, you don't find all these terminology. It says equal remuneration and also put conditions of service. So nowhere training, promotion, transfer, all these names are brought in here. It just, it just brings in a gender neutral approach. Moving on to the other one, challenges, web-based inspection mechanism. There's a whole lot of leeway given to administrators with regard to the web-based inspection. <coughs> Another important uh, uh, difficulty, implementation hurdle is that the, the labor department is understaffed. So very often the labor commissioners do, do the multiple roles, the dual role of being the inspectors too in Karnataka specifically. So 
uh, very often this creates a whole lot of difficulties the web based inspection doing away with the jurisdiction uh, kind of a jurisdiction being a lot of an inspector he personally going there and inspecting them and uh, taking out the associated responsive prosecution uh, activities the other area that i need to look into is dismantling the existing regulatory mechanism with no viable alternative so i would like to say that the concept of dilution is a concept of dismantling of the existing regulatory mechanism why i tell this is because very often when we look when we hear to the real life fighters under this labor scenario they say none of the benefits has related to us we don't we have the identity crisis we don't have the aadhar card no social security which happens to us no proper wages comes to us on time there is no concept of minimum wages we do have whole lot of bonded labor system being explored even now even though it is a bonded labor system and uh, very often there is the understanding that interestingly to share with you uh, one of the labor commissioners was telling uh, was making a statement the least invoked legislation in the state of karnataka is interstate migrant workmen act think about the development in activity is going on over there and the least invoked legislation is interstate migrant workmen we talk about the coordination between the two states when the, the when there is influx of labor from one state to the other state so everything goes in vain so this all clearly shows down that uh, there is failure trickling down to the crack that's what i would like to talk about it lack of need based criteria for the minimum wage fixation when you talk about the existing minimum wage legislation you have the norms fix the criteria for deciding minimum wages the nutritional aspect the growth the, the growth requirements the food requirements the lighting requirements the house rent accommodation requirements the uh, recreation facilities the kind of the children's education expenses that should go into the reptecos decision of 1992 which specifically talked about adding a component to the minimum wage fixation so all of these are not looked into under the wage code so the doctor i quote from the food and agriculture organization who made a list of all these kinds of requirements the sustenance of the worker the worker plus three heads one uh, three consumption units one worker with three consumption units is totally ignored but one of the interesting things is the recently circulated draft talks about those particular kinds of norms it is yet to be explored non addressable new age forms of employment so new kinds of situations like outsourcing or uh, multiple employers all these situations are not taken into consideration flexi type of arrangements work from home assignments which we now do during the covid 19 all those things are not taken into consideration aspects are not addressed through the wages code scope of discretion is too much discretion is given to the administrators that is one controversy coming up uh, the central government and the state government has a whole lot of uh, discretion that can be brought in with regard to the fixation of minimum wages then diluting the essence technology adoption is good but it should not be at the cost of the rights of the workers and it should not be compromising the situation of the workers so that is why it creates a whole lot of problems need for organizational policy the revision of the wage structure is yet another area to be looked into by the employer then uh, the contract labor system is yet again to be looked into the vulnerabilities and a new organizational policy for them and more a More, the most important aspect could be the interrelationship of all these codes. We can only be looking into the wages code as such. So, how the wages code interacts with the IR code, the Social Security code, the OSH code. So, the interrelationship is very much important because they do talk about the concept of wages. Say, for example, the Social Security code, the PF, it is based with regard to the wages. So, and it is um, the definition of wages in Social Security code is aligned with Code of Wages 2019. so these repercussions also we have to be looked into as and when we move on to the understanding fully of this particular wage code so that's why i started with the statement the law is to be looked into from the text the black letters the context and also uh, the action uh, that comes from the implementation uh, situations etc so i think i can conclude with this thank you so much for this opportunity uh, with humble respect and due gratitude to all the seniors all the judges over there sorry for the overtones academic discussions thank you so much now what is okay, it was in fact uh, express presentation on the subject uh, with which many of us are alien i mean uh, the subject is alien to us but uh, one of the doubts before i mean we would like to express our gratitude first of all to advocate lalita for introducing you to us uh, otherwise we would never come across such a faculty in our entire presentation so thank you lalita if you are here thank you very much and uh, before we uh, 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 some of the doubts that has come up the first one being whether in the 
existing wages laws like different wages laws uh, minimum wages act uh, subsistence allowance act or you take any act for that matter or the old wine in new bottle the code of wages is yes. there any legal sanction for the government to insist that the entire salary has to be paid even when there is no work no work no way principle has been diluted or rather is given a go by by saying that because of the covid crisis or the exigency without i mean is there any legal sanction or is there anything which uh, empowers or authorizes the uh, ruling polity or uh, the the government to say that you mr employer should pay the entire salary to the employees irrespective of the fact that everything is shut down interesting question and that too in the wake of the government notification and the orders coming up with regard to <clears throat> wages are to be paid in spite of the covid 19 lockdown right so what i would like to tell about this is there is always the understanding of uh, whether it's a moral obligation on the part of the employer to pay it off or whether there's a statutory obligation so when it comes to the invoking of the national disaster management act section 72 which overrides any other provision of the law enforced and also the epidemic diseases act and that too covid 19 has been declared as a pandemic throughout there is always the situation that comes up with regard to giving priority to the rights of the workers and interestingly uh, i read certain uh, articles with regard to which talks about the special we have already studied as law students that special act over always overrules the general one and so one uh, justification i would like to personally bring in will be the national disaster management act section 72 then the epidemic diseases act at any point of time the state government can come up with certain measures like lockdown of the work site etc so when work down sorry work site was locked down not because of the failure not because of the unwillingness of the workers definitely the workers should not be blamed for that this is a pandemic situation which should be taken care of by the employers so when state government has the authority to say that the work site should be locked down and they have done so and not because of the failure of the workers there is a statutory obligation arising out of these two important legislations that has been invoked so that's my personal take on it and uh, when you go through many of the in the, uh, industrial la sorry labor jurisprudence or industrial jurisprudence decisions throughout there is a common thread of proactive uh, importance given to the rights of the workers so that was what i was referring to the krishnayarized form of supreme court making the supreme court available to the indians which was brought in by professor vendra bakshi so as a teacher my personal take would be that when a pandemic is being declared because of this uh, the special law it has got its uh, statutory sanction and it should be obliged or to justice jay shankar nambia sir your question um i uh, before i go into my question um anuja thank you for that wonderful exposition of the uh, thank you so much I must confess, I haven't had the opportunity to go through the 2019 code, um, so I'm uh, I'm a little lost there. But much of uh, much of that. I think you did a, a spectacular job trying to condense everything that you know uh, within the limited time available to you, and therefore there's been an overload of information as far as we are concerned. Overdose. I could call this overdose. Overdosing. <laughs> Now, uh, briefly, just to respond to your comment on what uh, Sham had asked. um uh, no doubt under the epidemic uh, uh, you know uh, the the national disaster management act and also the epidemic disease control act uh you do have an obligation for uh, paying wages to a workman uh, because the establishment is not closed down because of any fault of his uh i don't think the question so much is whether he should be paid as to the extent to which he should be paid uh sure. Yes, I agree. I agree, sir. I agree. Concerns of employers across the uh, country is how much is to be paid. Um, now, when you look at that, and in the context of what you spoke, um, there seems to be a point in what their employers are saying, and then any wages contains different components. There is there is one component of the wages which is to ensure that there is an essence, you know, uh, uh, the basic wages for maintaining him uh, and his family. So. the other is the uh, component which facilitates certain other uh, activities that he has to undertake to go to work and then the third there is always a perquisite uh, component with okay. regard to the status etc which he occupies now you can exclude the last two sure. but the first one cannot be excluded so uh, 
it would be similar to the concept of uh, subsistence allowance for a suspended employee you would you wouldn't yes. pay the entire wages you would pay something that would enable him to subsist during the period of the emergency i'd like to add on sir something more than starvation wages too exactly so uh, and that that brings me to my my question to you uh, because i was uh, interested in knowing you said uh, the concept of uh, with a view to un- making it uniform the definition of workman has been changed across the uh, across all legislations and now you have only this uh, you know three yes. codes yes. Uh, and we're talking only about the uh, uh, wage code now now if the definition of workman is uh, uh, expanded to include even managerial uh, employees so sure. workman uh, it talks about it's not workman sir it's worker and worker em- excludes em- uh, those employed mainly in managerial and administrative capacity plus those personnel who are into supervisory capacity drawing more than rupees 15000 they are excluded so, yes they are excluded they come under employee okay so what is the difference between the worker and the employee i mean the employee is also subject to the uh, regulations of minimum wage yes 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 uh, coming to the concept of workers within the wage code uh, twice or thrice the concept of worker is used throughout it uses the word employee and even with regard to minimum the payment of minimum wages it uses the word minimum uh, it uses the terminology employee so earlier there was a controversy with regard to that more preference is given to the workers with regard to payment of minimum wages and not the employee but as of now with the 2019 code it talks about employee throughout for the equal remuneration purposes and timely payment of wages they use the word worker are so, they separately defined correct are the ex- are these expressions separately defined yes yes separately worker defined and employee okay employee yes yes and, uh, if the, uh, the the second part of that question was uh, you see if there is a uh, if if the uh, concept of floor wages and minimum wages applies even to employees and not workers yes. then uh, uh, i think we are making a dramatic shift from uh, the earlier uh, uh, scenario yes. and whether any, that is desirable or not any senior level employee can can claim for minimum wages and floor wages yes 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 now the you said the central government fixes the uh, the the floor minimum wage and the uh, state governments can thereafter fix the minimum wage in the uh, in the state and the concept of a schedule industry is now gone so it is across the board yes how does the uh, central government plan to fix a floor wage in respect of a of an employee who is in a managerial capacity in uh, in an establishment without knowing what the terms and conditions of his employment are which which have to be customized to various that's industries that's so, a ridiculous situation actually no clarity has come up with regard to it but the peri the wages code says it is applicable even to the employees and uh, while fixing national floor level minimum wage the importance will be given to the geographical peculiarities so different floor level wages could be fixed for different states that to across the board i i am very pessimistic about the uh, the whole uh, concept and one last question to to you and in fact i'm more interested in knowing what your opinion about this is uh when you're talking about these uh, uh, changes in legislation and introduction of you know consolidation etc are we are we have they actually gone into this changing concept of you know employment and employer relation employee employer relationship over the years because if you look at the traditional definition of employer employee the principles of collective bargaining etc which have informed all our labor legislations in the past they yes. proceed they proceed on a fundamental assumption maybe which originated in marxist uh, theories that when a when a when a workman is a contributory to the economic activity of the employer then yes. he must also get a share of the profits that is realized by the employer this is the basic ideology that informs our yes. legislation yes. but over the period over the years uh, you find a dramatic shift in the nature of the industry itself in the sense uh, instead of employing manpower now you are employing machines and machines are now given uh, uh, you know play given way to algorithms and computers now yes 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 now in that changed scenario you don't you do not have the concept of an employee per se or a worker it's a machine that is doing everyone you have a skilled man behind the uh computer terminals or the you know or uh, monitoring the algorithm in that context how do you fit in these concepts which 
pertain to an archaic area i mean a era uh, to this uh, particular uh, conviction of yours sir i would like to say this is a cosmetic surgery that is done that's what how i would like to call it as because uh, when you talk about the kind of flexi type of arrangements the work from home options the kind of employer employee relations that we had been into in the earlier uh, uh, times uh, the wages court is not doing anything with regard to any of these arrangements it's not talking about any of these situation and so it creates a wholly ridiculous situation as to how far the wages court that is consolidated can be looked upon as progressive so i feel mere dismantling the existing situation without a viable alternative will be kind a kind of counter productive situation that's my take on that okay thank you and i guess it adding to the confusion already existing in this labor jurisprudence no as always because uh, any any new radical measure will depend upon the people who ultimately <laughs> come to execute or implement it and uh, we in our uh, legislative history Uh, and implementation of laws we have not had that much of success you may have different concepts and you different uh, mechanism but the people who man it uh, you know don't reach the level of expectation that is required correct so so no no so, more participatory coexistence correct <laughs> so we have uh, mohan kumar and jaymon raising hands mohan kumar first mohan kumar sir please you are not audible Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay, madam, it was an excellent presentation, but I have uh, some of my doubts. Of course, uh, some part of it was cleared by Mr. Justice <laughs> Jaisingh Nambiar, but my question is regarding the the conflict of the definitions and its effects on the operation of the Act. And I may I may just point out in the ID Act, yes. under Section Two, small R R, the yes. wages defined. Yes. Wages is defined as wages includes DA, value of house accommodation, travelling concession, any commission payable on promotion of sales or business. Whereas in the code under section two Y, wages is defined as only basic pay, DA, and retaining allowance if any. So the question is that if a dispute that arises. which is which is liable to be adjudicated under the industrial disputes act it can also be yes there question comes in what would be the wages uh, to this uh, question i can only talk about the situation when ir code comes into existence because one of the new agenda is in all of all the codes so social security code is in the way it's already equally aligning with the wages definition here as per the wages ir code definitely the wages definition if it is brought in this particular situation this wages definition will be followed if not uh, i don't think there will be a uh, personally my understanding is that there will not be a change in the definition but as of now there exists a, a whole wholesome incongruity with regard to wages under id yes, act exactly that is the because there is no uniformity in the definition as far as these labor legislation are concerned concern, these are all having some close nexus with the adjudicatory adjudicatory process then another aspect section 45 45 for relates to claims to be adjudicated yes their application before the authority can be by an employee yes so the claims uh, you have pointed out that as far as payment of wages act is concerned or are the, the corresponding provisions of the payment wages act are concerned yes. that, that is liable to be adjudicated by a separate mechanism but yes. generally a dispute that arises under the code are liable to be adjudicated under section 454 by yes, putting yes. in a claim there yes, it's yes. it's only employee but if yes. that is the case why there be separate definitions of employee and worker we have a separate definition of employee under wages code and coming to say for example you were you were not talking about payment of bonus payment no, of I bonus no i got it i got it no, that is not my doubt see all claims under the code yes can only be filed by a claim petition So, sure. under forty-five four. Yes. But that includes bonus also. No, specifically the bonus chapter talks about. It is not excluded. Bit. Not excluded. <laughs> the bonus chapter. I'll tell you the which is a chapter specifically talks about bonus issue to be referred as to be deemed as industrial dispute. That is how very yes. interestingly they yes, have. Yes, exactly. Been. That is the point. That is the I problem. I will tell you which is the. It was there with me. The point noted with regard to specifically on the bonus chapter. 
you have an idea with regard to deemed as industrial dispute. Rest yes. all goes to the settlement officer, yes. the settlement claim, yes. claim yes. settlement officer. I'll just bring before you the chapter. I, that is with regard to chapter 4. Starting from 26 to 41, they say the dues with regard, uh, wherein there is a claim with regard to bonus payment, it will be deemed as an industrial dispute. Yes, 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 yes. yes. So there is high, in, uh, like I agree with you, sir, with regard to the kind of uh, uh, exploration you have done as to the ID Act definition yes. and this one. So, so can, I, can I just, uh, Monsar, uh, one yes, second, can I, can I just uh, ask one doubt? I mean, uh, from what you have said that a distinction has been drawn between uh, workers, definition of worker and that of an employee. And yes. worker is, you are, uh, it is said that there is a fixation of a certain amount or conditions to be a worker and all others are employees. Would it be correct to say that all employees, all workers are employees, but all employees are not workmen so that the incongruity pointed out by Mohan Kumar sir can be got over? Yes, that is one way of understanding it as per the controversies coming up with regard to it says worker is the um, there's a generic part uh, and the employee is the major term that we're talking about. So since we exclude certain kind of, let's say, for example, the managerial administrative capacity, supervisory capacity drawing rupees more than 15,000 per month, all of them are excluded under the work laws. So I agree with your proposition. So whenever the term employee is used, it takes in workmen also. So there is no need for segregating it. Maybe that might be the reason. I'm not very sure. I'm not gone through the code to be very. Honestly. An employee is now a privileged worker. <laughs> correct. That's employee is yeah. a uh, glorified or privileged worker. <laughs> Absolutely correct. Yes, Jaymon. Jaymon Andrews, you had uh, put your hands up, please. Uh, I may be too it may be too early to un, uh, ask your response on this but uh, have you gone through the recent uh, this one this Ma madhya pradesh uh, the some uh, they have announced some recording changes in the labor laws so but uh, see i don't know see i even i have not gone through the act but i, I just read the article in uh, that's why yes. on the basis of that i must so sure, sure. thank you so much sir so the, these are the constitutional or uh, I am asking with, with the constitution. I am asking a parent. So whether whether it is within the constitution or ultra virus, I have uh, doubt. That's what I am asking. See, see, uh, see, actually there is a relaxation of uh, labor laws happening in Uttar Pradesh, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and many other states. And they and that is too crucial, specifically with regard to working hours. Then uh, it may lead to more Even of child. They need not uh, need not uh, provide drinking water. That is one one of the. The necessary amenity is required under the Factories Act is being relaxed. So as of now, there is a move from the trade unions to file a complaint with ILO saying that this is not the way India should be conducting itself uh, with regard to taking care of the rights of workers. So it will be early a point to discuss about it, but I feel uh, no and change. I, I, my doubt is over the my, I, my, my doubt is over the ultra virus, whether it is it will go ultra virus uh, considering the present situation, constitutional right, because uh, yes, sure, sure. Definitely, definitely. Has the potential. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Now uh, uh, we have. Uh, uh, thank you. There is uh, some. One second. And see, Rajesh Devi Kulam has uh, put a question. Can you just come forward and ask the question, please? Yes. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Yes. We can hear you. Yeah. Tell me. So now, at present, the pandemic situation, the workers are engaged not fully. Only certain workers are engaged in the industry, even in plantation also. Yes. So whether such kind of workers are entitled for the minimum wages, if they are not employed full day or full month. Yes, yes, yes. And also one more question, which is related. Section 2 yes, of the Plantation Labor Act, yes. the workman is de de defined. Yes. So in that scenario, the workman, for the purpose of an industrial dispute, the, the new act is for the purpose of a fixing of a new or the minimum wage. Yes, and timely payment of wages, yes. Yeah, by timely payment of wages. If a, a dismissal of a worker is there, and if he's raised a question over his dismissal, mm -hmm. so this will come into play. 
or the the uh, the definition given in section 2s will come into play or the definition in the present act will come into play the present wage code is specifically limited to the fixation of minimum wages yeah, uh, the yeah. entitlement of minimum wages and timely payment of uh, wages alone with That's regard right. to not, not for the purpose of interstate dispute Ah, uh, and that too. One one additional idea idea is also brought in here. We, when once a person is dismissed, timely payment of wages for that person should happen within the second working day. To that extent, the wage code is there talking about such kind of situations, but nothing more, nothing less. Okay. Okay. Ah, uh, we have Ramakash G S. Can can he come forward and ah uh, uh, he has got a comment posted. Can you just uh, share it with us? Uh, I feel he is my student. I believe yeah. so. Yeah, yes. of course. That's why he has got a comment. Ah, he's a wonderful student of mine. Tell me, Ramakash. Ah, uh, good evening, ma'am, and good evening to all of uh, you. Uh, it was a very wonderful session. Ah, uh, so, ma'am, ah, uh, the question is that the draft rules which was released ah uh, recently on the code of wages prescribe that the ah uh, normal working hours per week, I mean, ah uh, per day would be around nine hours per day, and which could increase to twelve hours. uh which i believe would cover would be covered under the uh, overtime work and they also yes. say that in certain cases it could exceed to 16 hours in exceptional yes. circumstances yes. so probably corona time is probably the exception time but we don't know uh but then uh, so given that the average working hours uh, per week in diff- in most of the countries is around 40 to 44 hours so yes. which translates roughly to uh, 8 hours per day if it's a 5 day week Uh, yes. But here it's six day week, so which means that it's fifty four hours here. So uh, yes. does it mean that uh, we are probably a little exploitative and we are uh, overtaking the when we are uh, uh, too much into the status of developing country uh, that we are increasing the working hours like this? Uh, so yes. Cool. wonderful ramakash i am the happiest because uh, this was one of the issues raised by the trade unions with regard to there is highly potential this particular clause of uh, having the working hours from 9 hours increasing it to 12 hours and then to 16 hours it's highly exploitative that is the perspective of the trade unions they are opposing it so that was a situation at that particular point of time and now the draft rule is uh, being circulated uh, has it been completely finalized ramakash yesterday i was going through the same no ma'am no no that's that's the existing situation but uh, my personal take is it is highly exploitative and in no way you should be bringing in any clause or uh, talking about the improvement of the economic growth or investment or ease of doing business at the cost of working hours or the exploitation that is likely to happen that's my take ramakash thank you thank you thank you thank you very much and uh, any more uh, questions suggestions or uh, uh, any statement for that matter so that we can have an open forum or uh, anything is there yeah something that has come up is ah uh, uh, yeah one thing that i've been discussing with you in the morning itself the same sure. question has come I mean, it's really interesting we have been uh, thinking and talking about collective bargaining yes in industrial disputes mm-hmm. nowadays it has uh, 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 taken uh, the shape of collective hooliganism to a certain extent so the doubt is in the changing scenario Is does any of these new codes bless or take away, condemn or appreciate these sort of uh, mechanisms of collective bargaining in the hands of the workmen, strike, garau, etc.? Is it still continuing in the statute or not? Is the first question, and the corollary or the second question uh, uh, in connection with that is that is it not akin to taking law into one's own hands and hence an affront to the dignity of the court, or rather, is it not undermining? or uh, an expression of our uh, uh, the terminology used an admission that the uh, current legal scenario or justice dispensation machinery is insufficient and inadequate to an extent i feel this is an opinion kind of coming up but i would like to say that see tra- trade unions act uh, i generally don't defy the kind of trade union developments that has happened the kind of progress that has brought in and the way the trade unions have mobilized the kind of the rights of the workers within india is highly appreciable and we do have laws like trade union act which talks about section 17 and 18 specifically nothing uh, amounting to the concept of crime or offence can be talk, uh, in the sense be acceptable within the legal situ- uh, the legal scenario so i go by that and uh, i'm not here to talk as against the trade union movements definitely 
And coming to Deravo strike and all, Deravo is basically a major misconduct. Uh, in one of the judicial decisions, the president Deravo is considered to be a major misconduct, wherein disciplinary measures could be taken up. Uh, and coming to strike, uh, it has its own understandings within uh, sections 22 and 23 of the ID Act specifically. So it will be governed by those. Thank you. Thank you, Anuja. And uh, Prem, anything to be added? Hello, Anuja. Yes. It is a wonderful class. Uh, I'm new to this subject, but I do have a very small doubt because what, what I have been given to understand from your talk is that this code introduces the concept of floor wage, which yes. is determined by the central government, right? And of course, for the determination of that minimum wages, it could be structured by the appropriate government. That's a state government. Yes. That's what the sta I mean the code says. Yes. Now, which is uh, taking into account what you said that uh, standards of living, then geographical area, etc. And if the that particular thing is above the floor wage, the government cannot come below that. Yes. But if it is below, it has to be at least till the floor wage. Ah, now, my right. question is, does this particular code give any exemption for the particular appropriate government not to review or revise their wage structure till it comes on par with the, I mean, the floor wage? No option is given coming to the fixation and revision of minimum wages. There is a time limit given with regard to five years. There's a review period of five years given. Other than that, there is no other mention with regard to is there any leeway given for the state government to rise up to that level or to that extent. Okay, thank you so much. This is a wonderful class. Thank, thank you. So you thank you, everybody, especially Dr. Anuja for that wonderful exposition of this uh, field of law, labor laws. It's an initiation for many of us, and I hope that the persons will take interest and have this jurisdiction also as a subject matter of their study. Tomorrow, we are having Justice Katie Shankaran uh, on the topic, uh, res judicata and res sub judice. So once again, thank you all being present and for the wonderful participation. Anuja, especially to you. And, Thank uh, you so much for all of you there out there. Thank you so much. So, see you tomorrow. Till then, take sure, care. Sure. Stay safe.